Hi, this is Rob Osfield, the project lead of the Open Syngraph and the Vulcan Syngraph projects. In today's talk, I'm going to be going through the various different developments of the Open Syngraph and the Vulcan Syngraph over the last year. Um, so from the last August and last year's Syngraph to, to this year. Um, part one will be talking about the Open Syngraph, and that's just two slides, um, because my main focus has been developing the new Syngraph, and then the rest of the talk um, which will be 20 slides, will be dedicated to the Vulcan Syngraph. The links to this presentation will be provided on the Open Syngraph website and the support lists, and I'll tweet it as well. Um, I've written it as a resource to be used by um, the community afterwards, so there's links within the actual presentation to various different resources I talk about. Um, so I'd recommend that you have a look at the presentation um, afterwards, um, after you've left Syngraph. So last year, my focus for the Open Syngraph has really been on the um, stability and the ma and maintenance side of the Open Syngraph. Um, so providing a piece of software that um, the API is pretty static, um, the functionality is pretty static, but all the fixes um, that are required to get it working robustly um, are all made and checked in. Um, so the first step on that way was actually making a maintenance release back in the middle of September last year. Um, that was the 3.6.3 release uh, that was focused on bug fixes and build fixes. Uh, we had 66 commits since the previous um, point 0.2 release. Um, it's not binary compatible, unfortunately, as a couple of the changes um, to, to fix problems um, required kind of minor changes to the um, public API. So the API has changed, so you'll just need to recompile. You shouldn't have any issues apart from that. Um, Fast forward to July this year, 26th of July, in fact, just a couple of days ago, I tagged the 3.6.4 maintenance release. And again, it's focused on bug and build fixes. Um, the community has also contributed a couple of um, kind of minor feature enhancements, um, primarily to the, the plugins, um, so they don't really change the IBI um, significantly. There was 195 commits between uh, 3.6 3.3 and 3.6.4, um, so quite quite a bit more changes um, than the previous maintenance release, and um, that's really virtue of the amount of time that um, pa passed between the two. Again, unfortunately, it's not quite binary compatible with 3.6.3, um, but again, it should be as simple as just recompiling your application with it. Um, so while the API is not identical, um, the API is, is, is fundamentally the same. It's the same scene graph. It's just we've fixed a few areas. Um, the next plan for this, the rest of this year is um, to get 3.6.5 out this autumn, likely. That will contain uh, bug fixes. Um, I've already made a bug fix um, and checked that in. Um, no, nothing minor. It's related to the default font system and how that's cached uh, within OSG text. Um, uh, as typical with an open source project, it seems to be that you, as soon as you make a release, within hours somebody reports a problem, and you've been asking for months for people to report problems, and there we go, that's the way life is. Um, so I'll be making another um, point release, um, likely this autumn, to wrap up that fix and any other issues that need to be fixed that you guys come across once you start testing 3.6.4 out in the wild. Um, part of the Vulcan Singer project um, one of the things we want to do is add interoperability between OpenGL applications and Vulkan applications. So there's an extension that the um, Cronus have released for OpenGL, which is the XD external objects extension. Um, and there's a, a similar extension in the Vulkan side. And that allows us to share arrays, textures, frame buffer objects between OpenGL and um, the Vulkan side for our community, that means between Open Scene Graph applications and Vulkan Scene Graph applications. Now, its interest for existing Open Scene Graph users is that it means that you can actually split up your application between parts that are done with OpenGL and parts that are done with Vulkan, and you can incrementally adopt um, parts of your workload on the Vulkan side um, as you start moving your application across. So you don't need to just drop you're at, you know, set your existing open scene graph applications in stone, stick them away in a cupboard, and then start with a new product. 
um, you can actually start blending the two as time goes on. Okay, that's the uh, summation of the talk on the Epson graph side of things. Now I'll dive into the Vulcan side. So for the last year, the new project has been underway. Um, I started um, back in um, June last year. Um, and it's been funded by an OpenSync Graph um, user. So a VSIM company that uses the OpenSync Graph was keen to basically see a Vulcan um, successor for it. And they're currently funding um, myself to work full time and have done for the last year. And also um, Thomas Hogarth has joined me and is close to full time. And his focus is not on this necessarily the core SYNC Graph, but things like Windows support, Android support, OS 10, iOS, interoperability, and we'll, we'll chat about that later on um, in, in this talk. Uh, the license is the uh, MIT license, so it's even more permissive than the OSG's LGPL-based uh, license, and that's really to kind of help um, commercial users. There's no ambiguity at all whether you can statically link it or not, or use it in an embedded platform. Um, so just really make it easy for you guys to adopt it. Um, you can find it on GitHub at, under the, the VSG dev account. Um, there's the Vulcan Sync Graph. And we also have a support list, VSG users. And we're currently hosting that under Google Groups. So right, the kind of principal design choices between uh, for, the, for the Vulcan Sync Graph are driven by the concept of pushing productivity and performance. And on the productivity side, we want it to be easy to build and use, minimal dependencies, using modern tools and standards, and come up with a clean class design and implementation. On the performance side, it's really about unleashing the full potential of your hardware. And I'll cover that a little bit more in detail, just how impressive that can be when you do it fully unleash it. And also to make efficient use of processes, both single-threaded and multi-threaded, and also efficient use of resources, so memory, buses, CPUs, GPUs, IEO. Um, that's particularly crucial for the embedded platforms, so kind of the automotive sector, and um, phones and tablets. And but of course, we all want to, you know, on all systems, we'll actually want to make it as efficient as possible. And later in this talk, I'll discuss about some of those efficiencies. The Vulcan Singer project has been broken down into um, four um, phases in this initial development. Um, the first phase was an explore exploration phase, which went on for, from June to August last year. And that was really just figuring out what software technologies to use in this new Singraph project. And it kind of focused around learning and um, testing Vulcan, modern C++ and CMake. Um, and the latter half of last year um, we went into the prototype phase um, so we'd already decided that we we're going to use Vulkan, C++17 and modern CMake as the core technologies um, but we wanted to explore different design approaches and implementation approaches to how do we wrap Vulkan, you know, how do we um, wrap up different parts of the scene graph and test and both in kind of testing features and also testing the performance side of things, just to refine which direction we should take. And in the beginning of this year, um, up till now, we're in the core development phase. So we're actually writing the core scene graph and some auxiliary um, projects, which we'll discuss later in this talk. Um, and this new development phase actually draws upon the work done in the prototype phase. So we just kind of took the best elements that worked well within the prototype phase and they directly moved across into the core development phase and then the parts that didn't work so well we've basically refactored and after that refactoring we've then continued to add features and um, we port different platforms as well during this phase and we'll continue this work um, up into a kind of um, towards the end of this year and then we'll spend a couple months in a refinement phase where we're actually not adding lots of new features, we're just concentrating on making those existing features work really well, and that's where we can actually then try and get a 1.0 out for the end of this year. It's very ambitious, but that's what we're gonna go for. 
The Vulcan Singeroff project is currently a family of associated projects. Um, they're all underneath the, the VSG dev account. Um, so we have the Vulcan Singeroff at the top, which is the central Singeroff library. Um, we've put all the example and test programs into a separate project. Um, so that's VSG examples. And then we've got a utility um, like, um, project called the OSG2 VSG. Um, that basically helps convert open SYNGGRAPH, SYNGGRAPHs to Vulkan SYNGGRAPH, SYNGGRAPHs. So it's basically a conversion library and utility program. And recently we've added, in the last three months, we've added VSG Unity, which is a plugin for the Unity editor, and that exports native VSG data sets. And finally, a, a new addition to the family is VSG Exchange, um, which is focused on data exchange uh, and between different 3D formats and image data formats. And there's a utility program in there as well. The VSG Exchange project kind of had a, an overlap with the OSG to VSG and the VSG Unity projects. And as we'll discuss later on, I'll actually start to take over some of those functionalities. The Vulcan SYNGGRAPH is one library. So it's one static library or a, um, a shared library if you want to build it that way. Um, but it has multiple roles, um, which is a different approach to the Open SYNGGRAPH where we have multiple libraries that you need to link to to get these various different features. For the VSG, we've actually just gone for one library for all of these features, just to make it more convenient for you guys to build and to uh, build your applications against. And it also helps um, reduce the, the static library sizes. Um, so this one library, um, we structure the includes um, headers into um, directories and those directories have classes of different functionality within them so that's written that way to help you when you're navigating it to see all these kind of different classes that are have some, some kind of association between them. Um, the first of these directories is the core directory that contains the smart pointers, base classes and container classes. We have a maths directory containing um, GLSL style template math classes. Um, so it's, it's a bit like a mini GLM library um, all within the, uh, the VSG itself. Um, there's a nodes directory um, that contains the scene graph nodes. There's a VK directory which contains the Vulkan integration classes. There's an IO directory containing the input out and output and serialization support. So the VSG already has native serialization built into it. Um, the OSG took till 3.0 to get that. So even before we've got to an alpha version of the OSG, of the VSG, it's already got serialization. It's so useful, um, I put it right in early in the project. Um, next directory within the include system is traversals. So that has compile, dispatch, cull and compute traversals. Uh, with the scene graph, um, kind of similar to the OSG, it has its own traversals, um, but there's slight differences in the way we do things, uh, but it's, it's principally the same, you know, it's, it's similar in, term, in terms of concept. The, there's a UI directory, contains user interfaces classes, uh, which basically wraps up events and event handlers. Um, we have a viewer uh, directory, um, which contains the windowing and the viewing classes and a platform directory, which is platform specific windowing and event integration. So to make the Vulcan Scene Graph productive for you guys to use, um, what we've done, we've adopted um, C++ 17 as the base. Um, the reason for that really is that it's easier to read and write, reduces the external dependencies you need for your application. And frankly, it's just a lot more fun to code. Um, you know, C++ gets lots of criticisms, um, but the standards committee have done a good job of making C++ um, more expressive um, to use um, and less verbose. And you know, some of these features may seem quite um, overwhelming at first, and you know you have to work in a slightly different way to use some of the features. But actually, the, you know, once you get used to them. Um, it makes a big difference. And I'd certainly recommend investing the time to learn C++17 and adopting with your own applications. Um, you can still compile the OSG with C++17. So even though the OSG 
still is can be compiled with kind of pre C plus plus eleven compilers. It still compiles with three plus plus seventeen as well, so you don't have an issue there. Um, with C plus with Vulkan Syngraph, you have to use C plus plus seventeen features um, and a compiler that's compatible with them. Um, so that's just you know we're looking forwards. We're trying to make you know de develop a product that's you know best to use as we can at this present time. So we're not going to attempt backwards compatibility to old compilers and stuff like that. So it's a new project, new tools. Uh, the other um, foundation is Vulkan. Um, so we've we've encapsulated Vulkan with our own um, C++ classes. We haven't adopted the Vulkan C++ wrappers. I've not found them particularly useful and they're really bloated. So like the, the uh, Vulkan.hpp is over 40,000 lines of code, which is just ridiculous. Um, the whole VSG is smaller than that, and it does a lot more. Um, and our Vulkan wrappers also have um, robust memory management within, you know, built within them, and it's just a lot easier to use, you know, especially in the context of a scene graph. Um, so we have our own encapsulation of Vulkan, which is actually just makes it more convenient. And later on in this talk, I'll give some examples of how much difference it makes in terms of productivity. Just by looking at the amount of code it requires if you just do raw Vulkan in C versus um, our encapsulation of it. Another important part of the project, portability. So right from the word go, we've been focused on Windows and Linux. Android was um, added in the first six months. And then shortly after we had at uh, the end of last year, OS 10 was added and uh, this year um, iOS, um, both using Molten VK um, version of Vulkan. Um, to, which basically wraps up um, the Vulkan API on top of Metal. Um, and it seems to be pretty successful and performs well. Um, it's not fully featured yet, um, especially under iOS, um, but they're improving all the time. Um, it's an open source project um, and we've been very impressed with it so far. Um, I've already covered um, MIT license, so that's really just you know avoiding ambiguities for you guys who are developing commercial applications. Another big part for us was learning how to use CMake effectively. So there's some really good uh, lectures um, on YouTube um, about kind of modern features of C CMake and how to deploy them. Um, so we've adopted those, and it just makes it easier to build and install um, the Vulkan Syngraph and also to use that within your own third-party applications. Um, so finding the Vulkan Singer, finding out what settings you need to use on the different platforms, that's all done, done by the actual CMake um, scripts, the configuration scripts that are installed when you install the Vulkan Singer. Um, we've also adopted the, um, we've gonna follow the free software best practices. Um, so these are kind of high level best practices um, that we've done with the code and also how we organize the project. Uh, the intention is to make it easier for users and distributors to, to use the project. At a lower level, we're also following the CPP core guidelines. Um, so the idea is to improve software quality and inspire good practices. So, you know, we've adopted those which help us, you know, the developers of the Vulcan Syngraph internally, but also it should be an example for you guys when you look at the Vulcan Syngraph. Yes, it's used that um, guideline, and you know that's how you deploy it in real life. Um, so it takes, which is might be quite a dry example in perhaps the the, the C plus plus core guidelines, and we'll see it deployed within the Vulcan Syngraph project. And you know, seeing how it's used live actually helps you think how it's going to be used in your own projects. Uh, the performance side to the Vulkan Syngraph is something that is very much close to my heart. And, in, you know, throughout the whole of the Open Syngraph project, um, you know, performance has, has been close to my heart as well. So um, it's quite, this is the, the fun part for me. You know, the C++ is interesting and C++ 17 helps, but the core of it is really, you know, let's try and do what we can with the, the graphics hopper and make it, you know, make it sing. Um, a big part of it is the Vulkan API. Um, so that has far lower CPU overhead than OpenGL. It's faster and lower power. Um, it also gives us fine-grained control over memory management and synchronization. Um, this is one area that's always a bane of frustration for 
somebody using OpenGL, a lot of the decisions that you would like to make about where and when memory is allocated and when you copy data, that's actually in your control with Vulkan. Um, that does mean more work um, and you have to really understand what's actually happening. So it's a bit more complex to learn and, and use, but for power users, it's a huge difference. So we can actually be much more confident about you know, measuring performance and optimizing performance because we've got that control. Another big um, advantage with Vulkan is it's multi-threading friendly by design um, from, ground, from ground upwards. It's not an afterthought. You're not having to bodge multi-threading around it. Um, there's certain restrictions to it, but the model is actually really flexible and uh, it allows you to take a lot of the work that used to be done in the driver into application space um, and into your own threads and you can do things in the background um, if need be um, without in the interfering actual rendering and uh, that makes a big difference and it should be making make it, make it much easier to develop um, simulators and games that hit a solid 60 hertz or 120 hertz whatever you're, you're aiming for um, without dropping a frame and it just yeah it's going to be you know it should be much better for developing you know, high-end graphics applications. On the Syngraph side, um, to achieve performance, um, we really need to, um, you know, we can't just uh, optimize the API calls because you know, if you optimize those, um, but the Syngraph itself um, you know, still takes you know, five, six milliseconds on traversal of you know, the curl and the draw dispatch, then optimizing any, you know, the draw dispatch they'll only make it twice as fast. Um, but as we'll see in the um, rest of this lecture, some of the presentation, some of the benchmarks I'll show you is that you can achieve far more if you take care of the Syngraph side of things as well. Um, with Syngraphs, the main bottleneck, and is this has always been the case, you know, when I started working on the Open Syngraph and I had Don Burns um, kind of coaching me on how to, to do that, um, the mantra was bandwidth. It was the, the main um, bottleneck. So then we're talking about, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001, the biggest bottleneck for a single graph was memory bandwidth. Now, fast forward 20 years and CPUs and GPUs have got massively faster, thousands of times faster, um, but the memory hasn't. So memory bandwidth and the latency to retrieve memory has actually, relative to the actual CPU speed, got a lot worse. So it's become even more of a key issue um, to resolve. Um, to improve on that side of things with the Vulcan Syngraph, um, one of the uh, approaches we've taken is to minimize object sizes so that it just takes up less memory. Um, and with that, you also fit more memory, uh, more objects into the cache and you get less cache misses and the bandwidth load goes down. So you can improve in performance that way. Uh, another technique is to use, uh, try and store the data in close proximity to other data that's going to be used alongside it, ideally within cache lines. Um, another thing is to be quite aware of um, the kind of low level CPU parallelism um, that modern processors have. And to get best performance, you really want to be, you want to write code that can be compiled and ran on the actual um, CPUs efficiently. And you've got to be very you know, sensitive about the caches and the, um, the kind of branch misses you're going to get. Um, and one of the techniques is quite simple, avoid conditionals where possible. And you need to consider both the data and the instruction cache. Um, so it might be that you know, if you optimize um, some code that the instructions might be faster to, um, to be carried out. out. But if actually there's more instructions that you're using to do that work, the instruction cache might be blown and then that instruction cache needs to be refreshed and that can make it slower. So even though the instructions themselves might be faster, if you're actually having to go and refill the cache more often, then overall the speed can be lower. So you can get some kind of paradoxical um, changes. So you have to be just kind of aware of how things are going to be compiled down and ran on the CPU and just write it in a way that um, is sensitive to it. And you can well see some more benchmarks on that. Um, I found um, I'm currently now using an AMD processor, a modern AMD processor. Um, 
as my main dev system, uh, which replaced an Intel one. And I found that the um, AMD system was much more sensitive to things like um, branch production errors um, than the Intel one. So the OpenSync graph um, performed quite well on the Intel, um, but actually significantly worse on the AMD. Um, but with the Vulkan Sync graph, because I've designed it in a much more CPU um, sensitive way, we've been able to keep the performance um, basically equivalent between the two. Um, so the AMD system is actually now um, performing as well as the Intel system, you know, the kind of equivalent in, in terms of speed. So um, that's satisfying to see that um, we're able to actually, you know, get more equivalent performance between the two. But the important thing is actually both are actually far better than um, the OSG side, as you'll see the benchmarks later, significantly so. Um, another important aspect is that C17 has lots of features that you can use out of the box. Um, and some of them are really efficient and the most efficient way to do something, but not all of them are. Okay, so you've got to use those features wisely and actually be prepared to benchmark them. So let's have examples of those. Uh, one of the decisions I had to make with, with the Vulcan Sync Graph was do we use intrusive or non-intrusive reference counting? Um, so the Open Sync Graph uses intrusive reference counting. So the reference count goes into the OSG um, referenced uh, class, base class, and we have the OSG ref pointer, um, smart pointer, the points to it. So we could adopt that system or we could adopt the standard shared pointer. Now, when we look at the kind of low level side of things, a shared pointer is 16 bytes um, on most implementations. And that's because the shared pointer contains a pointer to the object that you want to um, reference and a pointer to the reference count. On, if you use a, um, an intrusive reference counting, all you need is a pointer to the actual base class, um, to the actual object itself. So it's just eight bytes on a, on a 64-bit system. So that's half the memory to store a pointer. Now, for a sync graph, all the internal nodes are basically group nodes of different types that contain pointers to other nodes lower down in the, the graph. And so essentially, it's a collection of pointers. That's what a scene graph is. It's a collection of pointers. So the size of those pointers becomes really critical. So if you double the size of the pointers, then the actual containers double in size. And so you just basically start requiring more memory and you have to traverse that memory. Um, so what I've done, found in benchmarking, scene graph traversals for a scene graph containing um, Intrusive reference counting um, is 25% faster plus than um, if we use non-intrusive, so if we use shared pointer. So um, if you see a project, a graphics project, using a shared pointer for its internal nodes, not a good choice. No, no, no. So you don't want to throw away 25% of your performance or even more just because you want to use the standard. No. So we use in the Vulcan Sync Graph something very similar to the, um, the open single graph. We don't use exactly the same classes. We do take advantage of standard um, C++'s atomics to the reference counting in a thread safe way. And so there's things we adopt from the standard library to make our code cleaner and more robust, but it's not all features. Um, another big change made is moving optional data out of base classes. Um, to minimize object sizes. So in the OSG, we have things like names of nodes and node masks and callbacks, and they are all in the nodes. Um, so every node will have them because they're in the base class. Um, that bloats out OSG node. Um, so it's, the OSG node itself is 208 bytes versus on the VSG node side, it's 24 bytes. So it's massively smaller. Um, not all nodes need a name, not all nodes need a node mask. Um, but in the design for the OSG was to, to put them in there um, for convenience reasons. Um, but in terms of memory, actually keeping them out of there and making them optional um, has actually been a big gain. So it's much smaller on the VSG side of things. 
Um, if you look at the OSG group versus the VSG group, the VSG group is 48 bytes and the OSG group is 232 bytes. So again, a massive difference in size. Um, another advantage of actually moving things like node masks and core box backs out of the actual base classes is that the um, when you're actually traversing the sync graph, you don't need to check them. So the open sync graph, when it traverses through the sync graph, it has to every node it has to check the node masks and it has to check callbacks. Um, so each of those is an if statement, and each of those is another little challenge to the branch prediction of the um, the processor. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Intel processor works out better under um, Intel uh, on the OSG than the MD does. Um, now, the MD, I believe, in the next generation of their um, processors will be improving on the branch prediction. Um, but there we go, that's, that's the difference. You might want to, for your Intel, or for your simulators and stuff, focus on Intel rather than AMD um, for the OSG, but less of an issue for the VSG uh, because the design is actually more friendly to the particular performance um, issues um, that you see on AMD. Um, and it's basically uh, makes them in a more even level playing field between those two processor types. Um, both are a lot faster, so I wouldn't, I'm not criticizing Intel at all. It's just we've been able to help AMD get up to a, a higher level. Um, if we look at kind of benchmarking of the OSG and the VSG um, on the scene graph creation and trust on destruction side, so nothing to do with graphics. Um, the VSG is, on the, so this is a benchmark um, I've written, is a very simple one of creating um, a quad tree. And in this case, it goes for this particular test was 11 deep. Um, so you basically create this quad tree, then you traverse it, then you destruct it. So the VSG on the recreation is um, 3.7 times faster. On the traversal, the VSG is 10.6 times faster and destruction, the VSG is 12.3 times faster. So this is the same work on the same complexity of scene graph and we're getting um, significant um, performance improvements. And that's all kind of down to these kind of design choices, um, making the um, nodes, the objects smaller and avoiding conditionals where possible. The VSG examples um, project um, has 12 examples in the core, uh, associated with core, which is basically without graphics, and then some desktop ones, which you have graphics, and then there's an Android example as well. Um, the core examples just focus on testing core functionality with the VSG, um, and, but I've been using those examples as I write the VSG features I write an example to test it, and then you know one of the examples I was just um, talking about in terms of performance was a VSG groups example. So you can run that and actually see the, the benchmark results yourself. Um, the desktop side of things um, has some more um, interesting in terms of getting out graphic results. Um, we have a VSG draw, VSG compute examples, which I'll discuss next. Um, we also have a VSG input one, which is test bed for text rendering and testing out the keyboard and mouse input. We have a VSG viewer example, um, which is equivalent to the OSG viewer. Um, it's a basic viewer, loads a native VSG 3D model and renders them. And finally, we have an Android example. And um, we don't yet have an iOS um, example, but that will, that will need to come. On the compute side, Vulkan supports com um, um, compute natively. And so it's actually pretty straightforward for us to do the same with the VSG. Um, so um, when I was developing that support, um, the compute support within the VSG, one of the things I used was the Vulkan minimal compute tutorial available on GitHub. And I ported that to the VSG um, using compute shaders uh, to generate a Mandelbrot set. Now the original um, compute tutorial is quite simple, only 805 lines of code, um, but we were able to get that down to 131 while moving across to the VSG. And that's because the VSG is able to actually wrap up um, and make it more convenient. There are a lot of the kind of settings for you know setting up all the Vulkan objects. And so it's one sixth of the code size. 
for the same functionality, um, which is a significant improvement over writing raw Vulkan. Um, another important aspect is not just that it's simpler and more convenient to write, it's a lot more robust as well because the actual memory management is all done using um, reference counted objects and when the lifetime of those objects uh, is ended, when they go out the reference count goes down to zero, they get deleted. They also then unreference all the other objects they're associated with and there's a hierarchy uh, within the Vulkan objects to make sure that you don't delete things like the Vulkan instance while you're still using it. Um, so the, the Vulkan objects lower down in the chain actually keep the ones that they depend on alive until they're finished and they get automatically cleaned up. Um, so that's one of the big advantages that you, you have by using C++. Um, for it we can actually simplify the memory management significantly and you know what one sixth of the code size for doing the same thing and having it more robust, we can't complain about that. On the graphics side, um, Vulkan's very fast, but it's verbose. Um, and, you know, everyone who's actually implemented anything with Vulkan will know it takes a huge amount of code to do something really, really simple. Um, so one of the places I learned Vulkan from was the Vulkan tutorial, which is available online. Um, and I basically, as I was writing the Vulkan SyncGraph, um, I used that tutorial as a kind of a guide and wrote a, the VSG Draw example as that kind of test bed. And so that test bed originally had lots of Vulkan tutorial code in it, or it had one equivalent to it. And it whittled, whittled it down as we moved functionality, you know, wrote functionality in the VSG and rewrote the example to utilize that new functionality. And over the last year, that's got smaller and smaller. So uh, the equivalent of 1,530 lines of tutorial code is now down to 191 lines of code using the VSG. So that's less than an eighth of the size. And again, you have these uh, robust memory management along with it, um, something that the Vulkan tutorial doesn't have. And because it's much smaller, it's much more destructive, much more um, easier to read and easier to maintain and also has the um, robust memory management just built into it. Um, so it's a lot easier to, to work with, basically. So again, it's an example why you'd want to use a scene graph and for do, to doing Vulkan work rather than just raw Vulkan. Um, it's a lot easier to maintain 191 lines of code versus 1530. Um, if you want to have a look at this example, have a look at VSG examples, desktop VSG draw. Another project um, within the OSG project is OSG TV ESG, and that converts open SYNGRAPH, SYNGRAPH to Vulkan SYNGRAPH. Um, we wrote this um, really so we can actually um, compare functionality and performance of the two SYNGRAPHs. And so as we wanted to support different features in the SYNGRAPH, um, we know that the Vulkan, the open SYNGRAPH is a mature SYNGRAPH and we, don't want to have, we want to have things like LODs and transforms um, and different types of state um, that the OSG supports. Of course, the, the VSG starting from scratch doesn't have all those features. So but feature by feature, we've been adding features on the VSG side of things so we can actually um, do the same thing as the OSG does. It has to do it slightly differently. Um, because it's Vulkan and because it's a new scene graph, um, but we can map those, function those features across. And basically incrementally, we've added features to the VSG and optimized the performance of the VSG um, using real world data sets. Um, the data sets I'm gonna show you are actually pretty old and crude, um, but they kind of, that's what I have available um, freely. Um, lots of the commercial um, scene graphs um, that people have out in their simulators and, and games, they aren't shared. So um, if you're able to share any um, world, real world data sets, then please you know, send me an email. I'm quite happy to sign, sign an NDA um, to use you know, those scene graphs privately, um, just so we can make sure when we're optimizing the Vulkan scene graph, it handles real world data sets really well. So let's have an example of comparing the OSG to um, the VSG. So here is a um, uh, an old city scene, uh, the city of Umia. So Umia um, University um, were one of the early adopters of the open scene graph. 
and they created this open flight database which they imported into the open scene graph now it's not a huge database and it runs pretty quick on um, my amd system with a uh, geforce um, 10 uh, sorry 2060 in it um, it does 360 hertz um, following a, a camera path um, through and around the the city and when we actually run that within the the Vulcan Sea Graph, we get three thousand eight hundred frames per second. So that's over ten times faster. And so a scene which was originally heavily um, CPU limited becomes one which is actually you know much more limited by the capabilities of the graphics hardware. Um, so here we can see just how much OpenGL and the OSG are holding back the modern CPUs and graphics hardware and it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> um, well you know, new work's not obviously embarrassing that's quite proud of the, the uh, performance difference um, but you can really see that once you start really focusing in on and making um, the scene graph as efficient as possible and using uh, a more efficient lower level API like Vulkan you can really start making a huge difference to the, the performance um, you can get from modern systems. Another example um, is even more extreme. Um, so it's a, a synthetic data set, um, which really brings the OSG to its knees. It doesn't even get 60 Hertz on my modern um, system here. And it's the draw dispatch, um, which is the, the, the picture in the background, is of um, the open scene graph, so you can see the on-screen stats. So the cold traversal is five milliseconds, which is pretty long already. Um, the draw disper um, the, the, the cold traversal is just the scene graph. The draw dispatch is the scene graph dispatching data, which is in the view first room, into the OpenGL FIFO. And then the draw GPU, the orange one, that's the work done down on the GPU. Um, but the GPU is being um, starved because the OpenGL FIFO is getting full with data. Um, there's so much data in this scene. Um, and it's being pushed every frame, um, it's just bringing it to its knees. OpenGL is just not well designed for this, uh, and it's not being used particularly well in this scene. Um, if you port that data um, across to the VSG, so it looks identical on screen, and we follow exactly the same animation path to test it, the Vulcan scene graph gets 1900 frames per second. So the bottlenecks, the CPU bottlenecks we're seeing with the open scene graph are almost entirely eliminated. And actually this scene becomes fill limited rather than um, limited by uh, vertexes or prim um, batching or the, the CPUs. Um, so if I actually reduce the size of the window, the actual frame rate goes up to 2,400 frames per second. Um, so that's obviously quite a leap from 52 frames a second. And this is for a modern system. So again, we're showing that actually using the combination of a new scene graph and new uh, low-level API, the actual performance can improve significantly. Now, you might be thinking, well, can't we just make um, the open scene graph adopt uh, Vulkan? That'll make it suddenly go at 1900 frames a second. No, it won't, because the cold traversal in the open scene graph, because it's actually got these um, large node objects to traverse each ones, and there's lots of conditionals, um, it just slows it down um, and even the cold traversal here is five milliseconds which basically if there was no other bottlenecks running then we'll get 200 hertz from it not 1900 so um, the actual coal um, and dispatch times on the VSG are a fraction of what they are on the, the, the OSG side of things now with the difference between the OSG and the VSG, what you should be expecting is creating, traversing, and destroying scene graphs is all more efficient significantly with the VSG. It can be 10 times faster. Reading and writing native ASCII and binary formats is also significantly faster. I haven't shown you any benchmarks, but it's um, between five and 20 times faster, depending on what you're doing. Um, the rendering is significantly faster. It's not uncommon to get 10 times faster, especially on CPU uh, limited scenes. Um, this is all achieved by um, focusing on small object sizes, 
for better cache coherence and lower bandwidth loads, avoiding conditionals where possible, and using less instructions per node traversed, and also improving the um, instructions per cycle. Um, it's significantly improved over the OSG. So the OSG is far more bandwidth limited than the, the VSG. So the CPU is stalling, waiting to actually bring in new, uh, new data in, whereas the VSG can actually just bring in the data, do the work it needs to do, and move on to the next node much more efficiently. And finally, the Vulkan side of things, filling and submitting Vulkan command buffers is far more efficient than filling an OpenGL FIFO. And all those combined, you know, there's also more um, differences besides this, but we don't have long enough to talk about those in this particular talk. Um, but altogether, we're getting basically an order of magnitude more performance on the VSG side of things and it's running single threaded right now. You know, it's 10 times faster plus than the VSG that's running multi-threaded. So multi the OSG is running multi-threaded and getting about a 40% boost from that, but it's still not close to what the VSG is able to do running single threaded. Um, over the next six months, we're gonna be putting, making the VSG multi-threaded. Um, but you know, for a lot of the tasks, you don't even need to. You know, a lot of the scenes right now that actually work, you know, are struggling to work well on the OSG and really needing the multi-threading to, to just to get to 60 hertz, it will be a doddle for the VSG. You know, best to do it with his hands time, time behind his back. It's significantly faster. Because the VSG is so much faster um, on these old data sets, um, we need new data sets, basically, which are much larger. Um, I've called out to the community, but I'm still waiting for really big community data sets to come forward to, to really thrash the VSG. Um, so what we've done is actually um, started a little, another sub project within the Vulkan Singer project, VSG Unity. And it's a plugin for the Unity editor that exports native VSG data sets. So why I've done that is we basically want these big real world data sets to kind of lever leverage the Unity asset, asset store and export them directly to the VSG and then start using them there. And in longer term, we're thinking that the Unity Editor will be a useful thing for the VSG community as a world builder. So rather than us trying to write a world builder and you know, uh, taking thousands and thousands of um, hours and years to write, if you can leverage existing tools like the Unity Editor, then that's kind of a leg up for the VSG community. Um, currently, the VSG community's uh, Unity products composed of the Unity to VSG C++ library that has C entry points um, to the VSG integration. Those C API entry points are used by C, C Sharp scripts that VSG provides to give us the, the plugin um, in, within the Unity editor. We're not attempting to build a feature complete version of Unity. Okay, so we're just gonna focus in what we need and what our users need um, and add to it as, as people require more and the community can get involved in that as well. So let's have a look at a couple of screenshots from it. Um, so you can export a single object from the Unity editor or an entire scene. Um, you can also map the Unity shaders across to custom VSD shaders. Uh, you can use compressed textures and mip mapping and export those. Um, you can export for LODs and cull nodes. Um, terrain um, with the actual layering texture is also exp exported. Um, we provide a preview window within Unity, so you can come up, you know, bring up a, a preview window to see what the rendering is on the VSG side of things. And there's lots more features in the works. Um, so um, talk to us if you're curious about it. Um, and that's something that uh, Thomas uh, Hogarth has been spearheading. So I've been getting him to work on that side of things. Now the latest um, addition to the family is the VSG Exchange Library. Uh, I've only just started writing this and its focus is really kind of third-party data interchange uh, and integration. And you can use it as a library or a utility. Uh, currently, um, I've written a GLSL to um, Spear V shader conversion and that uses the um, GLSL lang um, library available on GitHub. And, that, um, and also you can convert shaders um, to Spear V and then encode them within the um, source files by, and you can also do that for scene graphs, 
um, by using the OSG serialization scheme, um, which is actually able to write ASCII files to uh, a .cpp. And then you can embed those shaders and scene graphs directly in your application. Um, so that's going to be particularly useful in embedded platforms. So you don't have to actually install lots of different um, shaders and models. You can actually embed stuff directly in your application conveniently. Um, what I'll be doing is adding open scene graph support to um, VSG Exchange. And once I've done that, this project will replace OSG to VSG. Um, also plan to um, add other image at three daily bases as required. Um, that's something the community um, I'm expecting to really um, to dive in and, and help out with. So if you have a database format that you want to add, add supported, then roll your sleeves up. You can, and it's all open source under the MIT license. So uh, grab it and add it um, and give it back to us. And the other side of things finally is there's gonna be a C API um, to enable integration with things like scripting and other third party languages. Um, the idea is that once we have the C API um, in place, we'll be able to replace the v Unity to VSG library, which is within VSG Unity. So VSG Unity would then just be C sharp wrappers, um, which will plug into the Unity. Next steps for the, open, the Vulkan Scene Graph. Um, we have a roadmap file, which is part of the, open, the Vulkan Scene Graph project. So just go and have a look at that online. Um, that's updated as we uh, work through that roadmap, adding and saying, you know, what features we're actually finished. Um, I'm going to, over the next month, going to be fleshing out more of VSG Exchange. I'm going to add shader and scene graph building to it. Um, and then move more of the OSG to VSG and VSG Unity features into VSG Exchange. And then once they're done, those products will be updated. Or in the case of OSG VSG, once it's done, OSG VSG basically ceased to, you know, it doesn't have any role anymore. Um, so I'll just remove that. So we'll just use VSG Exchange instead. A uh, big area I'll be working on next will be multi-threaded database paging. So one of the big things about the OpenSync graph has been its ability to do database paging really well. And that's enabled whole earth um, databases and products like OSG Earth have thrived on top of that um, database paging support. And as the open scene graph works and the uh, you know the Vulcan scene graph is you know its big customers are going to be similar customers to the open scene graph they're going to be wanting to do you know whole earth databases as well so the threading is going to be and the database threading is going to be a huge part of that so i'm going to be basically implementing that once i've got the actual core paging supported and um, we're also going to be adding the support for converting the osg existing osg page databases across the vsg native ones and potentially we can also add support for um, writing to VSG page databases directly from the Virtual Planet Builder. Um, the community as well, it'd be nice to see them um, extend it just like with OSG Earth. It'd be nice to see perhaps a VSG Earth. Um, so I'll need to go and speak to Pelican Map and it's to see if they've got any um, ideas in that direction. Um, but my experience of you know, the Vulcan and Vulcan Syngraph um, is that we can achieve a lot better performance um, on that side of things than we can do with OpenGL. Now I'm expecting paging to be one of the things that really shines with, with Vulkan because we have so much control over the memory management and when objects are, are transferred down to the GPU, um, it's just going to make everything much a tighter and more controllable experience. Um, another area, big area to development will be next through the autumn will be adding multi-pass multi-stage rendering support to the VSG and then multi-threading and multi-view and multi-window support will add to this, the VSG as well. Um, another big feature will be adding the RTX mesh and ray tracing shader extensions from NVIDIA and any other big extensions that are added to Vulkan um, in, the, in this time period. Um, we obviously we've got a limited amount before 1.0 so um, we can't do necessarily everything that you wish to do, but um, um, you know if there's things you're interested in, you can always roll your sleeves up and add them yourselves because uh, it's open source. Um, another big thing will be adding the um, extensions to the Open Scene Graph and the Vulkan Scene Graph to enable um, integration between OpenGL objects and Vulkan objects. 
Um, so that's enabling the actual sharing of the objects and also the synchronization of use of those objects between the OSG and the VSG side. And there's lots more besides work to do. Um, aiming for 1.0 at the end of 2019, um, but being a software project, well, we're going to go for it. Um, we would love your help um, in, in achieving that. Um, and it's hugely ambitious, but it's it's fun. Yeah, working with Vulkan, working with C plus plus seventeen um, is a fun experience. So I thoroughly recommend it. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, this presentation is going to be available online, and we'll provide links on OpenSyncGraph.org with the support mailing lists, and I'll also be posting on my personal YouTube account, um, so you can watch the video of this and hopefully the audio. Um, we can see you on the OSG users mailing list or the VSG users Google group um, and just feel free to ask questions about this presentation or any other topics and that you wish. Um, my thanks goes to John Richardson for organising this BOF as he's done for many years now and um, so thank you for that. Um, of course I'm here in Scotland at home working away and um, playing in the, the lovely countryside I have around here. Um, so I'm not, I kind of missed going to SIGGRAPH, but you know, it's not too much of a hard life staying in Scotland. Um, we may be able to answer questions, um, so we're going to try and do that after this presentation. Um, but we're going to have to set up some technology and logistics of coordinating with the presentations. So fingers crossed we'll be able to chat live during the BOF. Right. Goodbye. <laughs>